This episode is sponsored by Echo. Hear clearly, care confidently. Learn more at echohealth.com. That's E K O health.com. And use code JSP for $50 off any stethoscope. Just Some Podcast Media. The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been warned. Everybody, this is Tina again with Good Nurse, Bad Nurse. Welcome back to another week of true crime and nursing, healthcare in general, but this week's definitely about nurses. We're actually doing part two of an episode that we started a few weeks ago. This is the Charles Cullen story that we started before the movie came out on Netflix on October the 26th. And I have, of course, two of my favorite co-hosts, Ben and Tom, from the Will Continue to Monitor podcast. Hey, guys. Hello, ma'am. Hey, glad to be back. Good to have you guys, as always. We started this out uh, at the beginning of October. We kind of did part of the story, kind of led up to really where the investigation started because the movie that aired beginning October 26th, it's still available on Netflix. That is more about the investigation and it's about the person who really helped to bring down this horrible person. And so that's why we kind of stopped it there before we watched the movie. And then afterwards, we thought we would go ahead and finish it up. So what did you guys think of the movie? I thought the movie was very well done. The acting, the gentleman who played Charles Cullen, psychopath to a T. I mean, like he just he played that part very, very well. It, it was Eddie Redmayne. I don't know if I'm saying that. And I noticed like he won the Oscar for playing another guy. He does a really good job of acting and portraying people from real life. And I got to be honest, even if you know nothing about the case, the movie is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you could not care about murder cases or anything like that and still watch that and have a great time like it is a fantastically made movie though it does pull at your heartstrings like when you're watching it you feel like you're part of the story like i mean that's what a good movie should do right should make you feel like you're part of it and certainly those two did a fantastic job of that they sure did what i love about the movie is that rather than focusing a hundred percent on the bad nurse. Ironically, the book that is written about this whole thing is called The Good Nurse, and it is about Charles Cullen. But the movie focuses more on the nurse who brought him down. And I love that. It brings a light into this story, and it brings a light into our profession. And it shows that there are amazing, wonderful nurses out there willing to risk themselves. And that's what we do a lot of times in our profession is we do sacrifice ourselves. And so I love that they brought that element into it rather than just focusing on the one anomaly, you know, the person who is one in a million people who would do something like that. Yeah, it, that's become a big thing is focusing on the killer instead of the things that happen around them. And that's, I think, a good thing to point out about this movie is it's the whole story. It's not just the bad guy who does the bad things. It's the victims. It's the nurses that work with them. It's the whole thing. But it really does focus on her becoming involved and deciding to do the right thing when nobody else apparently was. And I don't want to say anything else so people can watch the movie, but it is fantastic. Yeah, and we're going to get in. I will say that if you have not seen the movie and you want to watch the movie, don't listen to the rest of this podcast because we're going to give it all away. That was the whole point of waiting until after the movie. So, you know, stop what you're, you know, just kind of pause it here. Wait until you have a chance to watch 
the movie and then you can come back and listen to the commentary because I mean, we can kind of recap a little bit on the you know part one but basically part one we were just talking about his childhood and the things he went through he did have a difficult childhood there's no doubt about that that does not excuse and I will say this until my dying breath that it, there is no excuse for doing bad things to people you you don't get a pass in life just because you had a bad childhood and I am one that can absolutely say that I my childhood was horrible. I believe that we have to do better, you know, do better than what we experienced. Are you saying that you wouldn't do that? Wouldn't do what? Kill a bunch of people like Charles Cullen? Oh, absolutely. I'm definitely, I'll go on the record saying I absolutely would never, ever. Well, just to be fair, that's what he would have said too before he got caught. I'm just throwing out facts. That is true. That okay. is I'm true. Just saying, I'm just saying, I sure. see you nurse works nights, travels around a lot. I'm just throwing out facts here, Miss Tina, okay? I'm just pointing things out as they right. are. I am mm -hmm. not insinuating that a person who covers serial killer for a living would know exactly how to get away with it. <laughs> I'm just throwing out information. It would be the ultimate plot twist, though. Someone that has an entire commercial about being a travel nurse. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, go around. It's great for the profession. Wink, wink. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, I, I like I see what's going on. I can't wait till Ben and I do this story like we were tricked too, just like everybody else. So. Yeah. She's so sweet. Mm -mm. She's got that voice. You're just like, oh, Stop I want to make cookies and fall asleep to this voice. And then you find out. Well, here's the point. Here's the, 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 a lot of the, the times the point that I like to make whenever I'm doing my show is that you do not know what people are capable of. And I don't care how nice someone seems. I don't care how ethical someone appears, how honest someone appears. You do not know what people are capable of, which is why we have to be as transparent as we can be in healthcare. And uh, people hate that, you know, we don't like family members to be there. We don't like people watching what we do. I mean, the idea of having cameras in the rooms that are recording things, you know, the, just that very, that invasion of privacy and the feel like someone's watching every move that we make. You know, I mean, if you think we have a nursing shortage now, imagine if they if this is something, you know, body cams, you know, we felt like we were constantly, everything is being watched. You know, that's a nightmare. But I'm as a potential patient who could have to be in the hospital or my, one of my family members, I have to say, yeah, I don't trust anybody. <laughs> but do you think that's a product of what you do? Because nursing has been voted the most trusted profession for how many decades, mm -hmm. except for 9-11, except for 2011 or 2001, I should say, other than that one year. Nurses, by and large, are seen as trustworthy that we can be alone with people and take care of their loved ones. And that's exactly why they let us. So I think it would be a good thing for transparency. All right. I would have no fear if they put a camera in the room. But at the same time, I do understand that feeling of being watched all the time. It's not that I mind because I'm doing something wrong. It's because I mind because I feel like, oh, so you're telling me I can't do my job. Like, I guess that's how I would take it. I would be worried that you could at any given time take a clip you know, or a segment out of my oh, day yeah. and pick out a mistake that I make. You know, oh, I didn't scrub the the cap of a of the insulin vial for 15, you know, full seconds or something. And I mean, you just only did 13. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like. I f you would feel like you're be every single thing is being scrutinized and that would make it almost impossible to just be human and to be able to do your job. But at the same time, like I am very conflicted about it because I, you know, w nurses are the most trusted profession. That doesn't mean that we are trusted. That means we're the most trusted if you line us up with a bunch of other people who aren't trusted. Don't trust Anyone, people. No one is trustworthy. So if you line up all the, you know, a hundred untrustworthy people, then you had to put them in order. Yeah, nurses would probably end up at the, because the vast majority, I know the vast majority of people who are in healthcare, I see these people every day. I work alongside them. I see their integrity. I see what they do. I see how they do sacrifice themselves. So I know that. But then again, there are these people that slip through the cracks, and I also know that they exist. And that's what scares me. I was going to say, but Amy would have said that about Charles. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, 
I think before I don't know. the trial, she would have said that. I think she liked him and she thought he was funny. I don't know that she necessarily, because I know he gave a lot of people the creeps. I mean, I mean, he was not necessarily the most liked person. I think there were a lot of people that got, you know, kind of like the hairs stood up on the back of their neck around him. I, I think there's an inherent human, when you look at somebody that you don't trust, you get that feeling. Mm-hmm. And obviously, people that deal with people on a regular basis, whether they can pinpoint or not, they're around somebody that killed someone that possibly murdered several hundred people. I feel like you pick up on that. I feel like there is that innate human like reception of other people. I mean, I don't trust Ben at all. You can see why clearly. I I can totally see that. Um, oh yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about it. Person, yeah, thank you. I knew somebody was going to see it as well as me someday. You don't kill that many penguins in Antarctica and just get away with it, Ben. We know what happened. <laughs> no comment. Well, I guess we so, can get started, though, with this. Yeah, yeah I mean, we kind of <laughs> yeah. tiptoed around the movie a little bit. But really, what I'd like to do is kind of pick up where we left off from the first episode and get into this investigation. And so in 1999, Charles Cullen took a job working in the cardiac care unit at St. Luke's Hospital. He worked there for about three years. While he was there, of course, we eventually find out he murdered at least five patients while he was there and maybe even attempted to kill two more patients. And then on January 11th in 2000, he attempted to commit suicide once again. This time he lighted a charcoal grill in his bathtub and was hoping that he would succumb to carbon monoxide poisoning. But his neighbors smelled smoke and called the fire department and police. And Cullen was taken to a hospital and psychiatric facility, but then returned home the following day. So no one suspected apparently that he was murdering patients at St. Luke's until a coworker comes upon basically a little pile of empty vials in a discard bin. I'm picturing for those of you who work in hospitals, you know, you have that bin where you can like throw vials of medications or like maybe IV bags that have been hanging in a room and and you're discarding them and you don't want to throw, you don't want to put that down the the sink. So you put it into this container. That's kind of what I'm envisioning. But this, they come across this and they're like, whoa, why? Like, there, there's this huge pile of this cardiac medication that you would normally put in someone's IV. And there's literally no one that should have, that that needed this medicine. So what's going on here? For those that don't know, one of the drugs that he was known to use frequently was digoxin. And digoxin traditionally comes in an ampule. So if you're not in medicine, it's not something you just pull the lid off, you easily put a needle in, you have to break the top off. So it's a very common thing in a hospital but you also notice it like that's not a regular tube that's an ampule and there's only certain drugs so if you see a large pile of them you know instinctively that first of all you should never pull out a pile of this drug in the first place a little bit of digoxin goes a long way yeah so that would be a pretty clear tip off to anyone on that unit that deals with that drug they would know instantly there shouldn't be 12 vials there there should only be one maybe no. you know like there should definitely not be 12 cuz for some reason you did push that medicine one two vials you're not going to you're going to yeah. go to something else okay you're not going to risk digoxin toxicity or whatever you're going to move on to another med if that didn't work so there's just no way If you didn't need it and you got two ampules of it, you are likely going to end up in cardiac arrest. So, I mean, well, yeah, that's yeah. So, I mean, either way around, this guy was there was obviously a nefarious purpose for it. Like nobody's going to leave a pile of 12 amps of digoxin. I keep saying 12. I don't know. I'm just saying it was a large amount. Well, it was enough that they looked at that. You know, this coworker looked at that and went. Something is way off here. And they reported it. And then there was an investigation, an internal investigation. Air quotes, internal investigation. Yeah. Yeah. Air quotes, a lot of air quotes around internal investigations from these hospitals. Yeah, because you would think, okay, end of story, caught, police (laughs) come in, you know, no more. Nope, not what happened. He was offered a deal by St. Luke's Hospital to resign and be given a neutral recommendation, a neutral recommendation. Oh, that's nice. Or be fired. Now, which one do you think he picked? Probably not fired. Yeah, I'm going to go with yeah. the neutral recommendation. Yeah, he resigned. And basically, he was given the same recommendation as someone who didn't give a 
30 day notice before leaving the hospital. If you think yeah. about it. So yeah. he's not rehirable. No. I would assume that's the recommendation. Yeah. I'm sure St. Luke's put that a real bold lettering on his mm-hmm. file somewhere is don't let this guy come back. Yeah. So he resigned. He was escorted from the building in June of 2002. Um, seven, seven of his coworkers at St. Luke's later alerted the Lehigh County District Attorney of their suspicions that he had been using drugs to kill patients. Investigators never looked into Cullen's past and the case was dropped nine months later for lack of evidence. This is one of those times in law enforcement that I don't think there's an answer. Well, there's an answer and it's a someone screwed up and didn't do their job. And that'd be the Lehigh prosecutor. But I can't imagine there's ever a time in any situation that if seven people come up to you and say, hey, we worked with this guy. And we definitely think he's killing people with this drug. We work with this drug. We find this drug. It's something's improper. And the prosecutor never once looks into it. I absolutely have no idea what could have led to him not looking into that. I feel like if this had been made, if this was a movie, okay, that we just went to see, it's not based on a true story. You just went to see this movie. And this happened. Okay. As nurses, you know, the three of us were like, hey, movie night, let's go watch a movie. And we're there. We would be sitting there looking at each other like, yeah, right. That's not possible. Duh, yeah. huh, sure. No, I agree. Like I the agree. hospital were really do. And you as a police officer would be going, no way. If you had yeah. seven nurses coming, if I had seven nurses coming to me, telling me this, there's no way that this did not. But this is a true story. This is how this happened. This is exactly how it happened. So the hospital that he, he actually ended up going to another hospital now. The whole time doing the you know part one of this story, it just boggles the mind at how many times you say, so then he was killing patients here and they suspected him and then he quit and then he went and got another job and then he quit and then he went and got another job. And like every time it's like, kill patients here, yeah. quit, kill patients there, quit. And that every time it's like, yeah, they started suspecting him. Yeah, they started suspect, you know, and here we are again. He gets another job after this whole suspicious incident that happens, gets another job at Somerset and that hospital starts to notice some things that are definitely, mm -hmm, I mean, just some things are definitely not right. They notice he was accessing rooms and records of patients who he wasn't assigned to. So they're watching him for a reason. Now, whether or not they're just really diligent I do believe that there are some hospitals that have very good risk management programs that there are people that are really watching this stuff all the time. You know, they're they have computer programs with algorithms that are literally going, okay, this is these employees live on this street. And if they access the records of another of a patient that lives on this street, you know what I'm saying? Or a a patient who has the same. I feel like there are algorithms out there like that. And there are some hospitals that are super good at it. And there, I'm assuming this must have been a hospital that was literally on it, you know, when it comes to this sort of thing, because they, they noticed, they're like, "Mm, why are you going into all these patients records that you haven't been assigned to? And if you've never been through hospital orientation, and I've been through a couple, every hospital tells you the same thing. It's a HIPAA violation to access patient charts that you are not responsible for their care. You will be prosecuted. It is a federal law. Like every stinking hospital in the United States of America says this. So it is actually nice to see at least one hospital decided to follow through on it and actually did the thing that every hospital talks about, which, again, just makes me very irritated at the story because I can't tell you how many times I've sat through people talking about this stuff and then you research this story and you're like, oh, so all the BS you've told me (laughs) clearly didn't apply to murder, but to protect the hospital, I bet you it would apply. Like it just, it's very frustrating to watch this as a person that's worked in hospitals and see what this guy did. Yeah, but I wouldn't sing the praises of Somerset just yet, Tom. Well, good point. (laughs) That was Tina's fault. She said it. Well, you know, <laughs> we're just talking about one little aspect here. Uh, one, one, little, one little person who decided, you know. One, one little thing. <laughs> to so. do their job right. Doesn't mean everybody that did. That guy got fired. Yeah, that yeah. guy got fired. Like, what are you so. doing? 
Yeah, stop, yeah. stop looking at yeah. here, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. What, what guy got fired? IT. Well, apparently, while he was at this hospital in Somerset, he killed at least 13 patients, attempted to kill at least one more by mid 2003. Using, as you said earlier, digoxin. He also used insulin and epinephrine. And then on June 18th, 2003, he unsuccessfully attempted to murder a patient by the name of Philip Greger. He was discharged and then did die six months later due to natural causes. So the hospital is noticing, they're they're noticing Cullen and they're kind of keeping an eye on him. And so what they're saying is, okay, your drug requests are including many orders that are immediately canceled. So you're going in and going, oh, I want digoxin. Oh, never mind. I don't really need that. So what happens when you do that, if you say you pull up a patient's record, you hit, maybe you know a patient has digoxin under their account, or maybe you hit override. I don't know. But then you pull it up you can hit cancel and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. You hit cancel and you move on as if nothing ever happened. But the drawer will open. You can open it and you can, there it is. The medication is exposed. It's not like an opioid. It's not like a controlled substance that you have to count. You know, it, yeah, you can just, there it is. It's open. You could take whatever and then hit cancel. And I guess he probably thought there was no record of it. I would assume that. And for people that are wondering and they're listening to this, because it doesn't matter if it's Pixis, OmniCell, whatever company, they all do very similar things. But it's because, well, the vast majority of healthcare workers are actually not trying to kill patients. Right. And so they are anticipating maybe this accidentally happens. That's why those functions actually exist. So for people that are like, well, why does that even happen? That's why. Yeah. The v- millions of nurses every day are going through you know, drugs that are trying to pull stuff. These things happen. That's why those cancel functions are part of this. So if that's how you're wondering, that's why. That's why he was able to get a hold of it. Which is totally fine, except that if you have a very astute person who is paying attention to these reports and they say, okay, it's one thing for a nurse to randomly every now and then occasionally accidentally yeah, but but every day no you're yeah. every and every time it's digoxin or something that could potentially yeah. be lethal Mm-mm. The, i do want to point that out for just a second that i noticed as a nurse that still hasn't been changed because as you, you said controlled substances we have to count we have to do all this stuff but for some reason drugs that can kill you yeah nothing like i could pull out 12 bottles of propofol well, that's true. And, and put one and, and, you know, have a problem because there isn't for that. So I do think that there are some things I think maybe hospitals can still do better. But I don't think that putting bars over every drawer in the Pixis is going to be the answer because that would actually hurt more patients than help. So, yeah, to be fair, I just wanted to throw that out there because I know a lot of people listening to this probably don't work in hospitals and are like, well, how? That's how. That's why those things are possible. And I'm sure that there are people who are working on ways around that, you know, problem to try to keep from hindering actual patient care and hindering the jobs of the people who are really trying to help people, which are most of the people that are just in and out of the med room trying to get, you know, get in there and get their meds, get out and do things and, you know, but then somehow filter out this one random person out of thousands, somehow filter out this person and go, hmm. It is, it is a tough one. Well, apparently the hospital did delay contacting the authorities, even though there were some suspicious things that happened. Um, and but so the, he actually killed five more patients and attempted to kill another before they finally reported. What happened is in October of 2003, there was a patient that died of low blood sugar and they alerted the police at this point. Which just kills me that it took that long. You have all of this mounting evidence you have suspicions and you're like well maybe he's gonna stop i mean i just it frustrates me well then on top of it in july of 2003 the new jersey poison information and education system actually contacted the hospital so at that point even if they weren't sure i am grasping at what reason they gave to not because july to october is several months Put yourself in the position of the hospital administration. Pseudo law enforcement, a government agency has contacted you and said, we think one of your people are killing people. 
You've had five unexplained deaths, and now you have a guy pulling stuff out of med drawers and canceling it that can kill people. I don't understand what the lack of action was. It's very hard from both the law enforcement and the healthcare side to see. It's very sad and, again, frustrating to look back and see all these failures because it's not one. Well, and then they start investigating. These investigators are taking it seriously and they start looking back at his previous employment history, which, of course, as we know, reveals what? There were suspicions all along in all of his past jobs about his involvement in patient deaths. So, I mean, right away, they're like, oh, these investigators. And, you know, I mean, think about it. Investigators are going, okay, wait. So there's these suspicious things. He's accessing this medicine. He's doing this. It's not adding up. Well, let's go. Has he ever been accused? They go to the previous employer and they're like, you know, they, of course, you know, they're talking to nurse, the other nurses that worked with him. Uh, yeah, I thought I told somebody, you know, the way to listen. Imagine, you know, as a police officer, Tom, imagine or even as a coroner, you work with the you work in, with these types of investigations as well, Ben. I mean, think about this from that, you know, law enforcement point of view. You're looking back and you're going, oh, my gosh, are you telling me you went and told somebody and they didn't do anything about it? Yeah. So that's actually one of my favorite parts of the movie is when the two detectives first catch the case and they're starting to read stuff and you could see their mounting frustration instantly. They're like, wait a second. You say you have a case. You hand me like three pieces of paper. You say you have all these files. You're not giving me any. Wait a second. You hired a guy that you're now telling me seven other hospitals or whatever the number was at that point have got let go of on suspicion of hurting patients and nobody has come to the cops with, and you could just see the look on their face. And I know they're acting, and I know they're truncating a very long process into a couple minutes for the movie. But it still was like, finally, like somebody has seen the light. And as an investigator, again, I can absolutely see things from that point of view. Like, wait a second. You've had other multiple professionals tell you the same thing. You've had other hospitals tell you the same thing. You've had suspicions, and you've done nothing. It's an incredibly bad situation to start with, and I can't imagine how terrible they actually felt. Like, you are looking backwards through time and looking at all the mistakes as the detective. It had to have been terrible to go through and know that there's at least a dozen people that should be alive that aren't because of simple, I just didn't do anything. And I'm betting that the investigators contacted the Lehigh County Attorney's Office. Oh, I bet so. <laughs> to inquire what exactly they did not do when they had multiple nurses reporting this a significant time ago that could have saved so many lives. Yeah. And I'm sure that's – they probably – first of all, they probably did it, one, so they didn't go over the same information. Like if you already did part of a workup – there's no point in me doing it. So that's probably the first reason they called. But probably the second part was, hey, <laughs> you really dropped the ball and you need to know it. And honestly, I bet you that's half of what that phone call was. I would think so, too. You know, what's interesting is that they fired him on October 31st in 2003. And we're recording this, this is lit literally one day later. This is like November the 1st. And yesterday was Halloween. But why did they fire him, guys? This is, I thought this was weird. Like, they tend to just kind of almost like make up an excuse to fire him. I would assume a couple things. First, does his hospital have a union? As are union rules against them being able to just let go an employee without cause? Because then they'd have to admit what the cause was. And so, therefore, they can't because then they would have to admit culpability. So that might be one of them. Or the second is they flat wanted to get rid of him and they didn't have the evidence because they didn't want the evidence. But they just wanted him out of there. Yeah. Oh, they want the problem gone. But again, it becomes it's like ordering a D-dimer. If you order it and it's positive, you caught it. Yeah. You got to deal with this. OK, so if the hospital does this investigation and they catch the bad guy, they have to admit they have a. You got to get a VQ scan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are going down the hole that <laughs> nobody wants to go down with you, but we're going down it. Yeah, that's exactly. And from a hospital administration side, that's what I would assume. And I know that sounds terrible, and it is terrible. But at the same time, if you're a hospital administrator, you have to go, well, I have to keep the hospital open. I don't say it's right. I don't say that it's what I would do, but I guess 
if I had to look at it in some way, that's the way I look at it is these guys knew the problem. They didn't want to catch it because if they caught it, then they have to admit it. Hey, Todd, did you know that Superman had a lot of superpowers? I mean, he had the ability, you know, he had like the x-ray vision, he could stop a train and stop a bullet and all this other cool stuff. You know what else he had? He had super hearing and he had the ability to hear everything on Earth, every conversation on Earth, which is a little creepy. But I mean, that's, you know, from that's from the comic books, had the, that ability to. But you know what else gives you super hearing, Tom? An Echo Lippmann core stethoscope. Exactly. Because it gives you that 40 time amplification noise cancellation it bluetooth right to your phone and i mean you can have superman type hearing it is a game-changing piece of equipment i hope everybody listening gets one go to echohealth.com it's ekohealth.com use code jsp it gives you 50 dollars off your order let you know that we sent you hey tom who makes some of the strongest cbd products on the market today that would be cbd stat and whose products are completely thc free i believe it'd be cbd stat and who makes a warming salve, a calming, cooling lotion, oils, and other salves? Mm, I'm going to say CBD Stat. And who loves your healthcare people? Definitely CBD Stat. That's right. CBD Stat is going to give you a 40% discount for being in healthcare. You go to cbdstat.care slash healthcare, fill out that form. They're going to give you a permanent 40% discount for anything you order from them. You're listening to our show and you're not in healthcare and you're like, well, I feel left out. Well, we don't want that to happen. You go to cbdstat.care, you put everything in your cart, and then when you're ready to check out, Tom, what code do they use? JSP20. Yeah, JSP20. It's going to give them 20% off their product just because you're listening to our voice right now. Go check them out. cbdstat.care. So they, they basically just said, hey, you know what? We were looking back at your application where you first file, you know, like applied for a job here. And we noticed that the dates on here that you said you worked at these other hospitals was off by a month. And so we're going to have to let you go. Sorry. To become someone else's problem. Yeah. Yeah. How pathetic is that? So that kind of brings us to our good nurse. And it's all kind of meshed together. But our good nurse is Amy Loughran. It's spelled L-O-U-G-H-R-E-N. I'm assuming that's Loughran. I honestly don't know how to pronounce it. Sounds like Loughran. But She is the nurse who worked with Charles Cullen. She befriended him. She said he was funny. She had a great relationship with him there in the hospital. If you watch the movie, and of course, if you're listening to this, I'm assuming you watch the movie. Yeah, Tina's only worn just three times. I know. I'm just telling you. If you watch the movie, you'll see, you know, that you'll remember that they... She, he was at her, he came over to her, her house. He babysat her children. You know, he showed up very creepily at one point, like he was just there. And this was after she kind of found out all the suspicious stuff about him. None of that stuff actually happened. I was kind of reading some interviews from her and she said that most of the movie is true. It's absolutely every, you know, they were pretty much spot on for most of the movie, but they wanted to basically portray how close of a relationship the two had. Otherwise, it kind of doesn't make any sense. But they really were close. And for those people who work in hospitals or or work anywhere, and you have somebody who you're really good friends with, you know, at your job. And when you're working with them, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, this is, I'm working with this person. Then, you know, like you can be, they're almost like family at work. But then when you're, outside of work, for whatever reason, you don't actually connect. She said that they kind of lived farther, kind of far apart. So they didn't really connect outside of work. So the whole part about him babysitting and all of that stuff, he actually never met her children. So that part wasn't true, but she said everything else was. And But they were just kind of like trying to show how close of a relationship the two of them had. So what she actually said in um, one of the interviews is she said, it's not in my nature to betray one of my friends. So she kind of was going against her, her own nature, I guess, to have to do something like this. But she knew, obviously, that she had to do it. And so um, she said what she loves about nursing is that she could protect the vulnerable. And that's how she looked at this. She's like, you know, she knew he was betraying our profession and betraying our vulnerable patients. And so she looked at it like she was protecting them and she considered herself a badass nurse. (laughs) Clearly she was. There were the two main investigators 
you got to have give kudos to them because finally somebody came along that sunk their teeth into this and we're not going to let go. And they're the ones that kind of, they went in, they were investigating, they were interviewing people, looking at abnormal lab reports after the deaths of several patients. And as they're interviewing people, they noticed something special about her, about Amy Loughran. They decided to take a chance on her. And then instead of, you know, because Tom, I'm sure you can speak to this, but what they were saying is, you know, typically you don't just reveal things about an investigation to people who you are investigating or, you know, interviewing can mess up your whole case. Well, not only that, at that point, they likely didn't know if he was working by himself. So they were probably trying to figure out, was he by himself? Yeah. So that's the other reason you don't reveal your information. You don't know who you're dealing with. So, I mean, well, at this point, they, they likely did not. They probably had some suspicions, but they would probably also assume he had help. So the fact that they did tip their hand, she clearly built some type of rapport with them, like during some type of interview. And I think that's portrayed very well in the movie. Like they just show her some information and she's like, no, that's clearly not right. So they they obviously got the sense she is not about the BS. Like she is here to help us and she's going to be neutral. And as an investigator, that's what you want. You don't want somebody that's just going to agree with everything you say because that's likely to get you false information. You need someone that's willing to go, no, that's wrong. Yes, that's right. So the point is, is that when they found her and she's, you know, being a badass and she clearly is, they said, this is the one. This is the person that we need. Yeah, absolutely. They said she came across as strong minded, intelligent. They said they rolled the dice and revealed some of their findings in the investigation to her. And so that kind of helped open this whole thing up. They showed her a record of of the names and dosing information of some of the drugs that Cullen had withdrawn while on duty in the ICU. And so she's like, oh, no, there's no way that he should have had to withdraw all of that medication. That's not right. And she knew it. So she was on board. A light bulb went off and she started putting the pieces together. She knew at that point that she had to stop him because she knew even though he left that hospital, he would just go get another job as he had done over and over again. But the problem is she is a single mom. She's got two daughters at home and she was worried. She's worried because she's, you know, thinking this could put my daughters, you know, at risk, but me at risk. So she checked with her oldest daughter, Alex. She was 11 at the time. And she said that she said, I told her our lives could completely change. And she basically said, I don't know if I can do this to you. And Alex told her, mom, he's murdering people. So her, (laughs) I mean, that just, it kind of restores your faith in humanity at this point. You're just like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. An 11 year old has more integrity than every adult in the administration of every hospital he's worked at that they know. Let me rephrase that. The hospitals where he clearly did something wrong and they suspected him. An 11-year-old girl has more integrity than all of them put together. Exactly. I just want to point that out. Yeah. So with her daughter's blessing and her daughter's permission, she started working closely with the investigators and the assistant prosecutors on the case. She agreed to wear a wire and met Cullen at a restaurant. And she was trying to, she was thinking she was going to try to coax him into admitting his crimes while they were waiting outside. She said she was terrified. She was morally confused conflicted she said she was wrestling with how much she actually still cared about him as a friend and she said i didn't know the murderer which is you know that's the th- that's the weird part of this is i think you you can be blinded you know even though there were people all around him who got the heebie-jeebies around him, she was trying to look past the weird i feel like she was trying to go i know everybody thinks you're weird but You know, she wanted to accept him for who he was and try to befriend him. And it's noble, but she kind of ignored those warning signs, I think, that everybody else was feeling. Denial is a powerful human emotion. And if you don't want to see, I mean, if anybody just watched the series Dahmer, look at his dad. Like, there's all that stuff going on clearly in front of everybody. And his own parents are like, not our kid. I would say in this case, that's something very similar is. While a lot of people did step forward, obviously seven, you know, came forward at one hospital and said something's wrong. I think the vast majority of people would rather look away. And she didn't. So I'm glad. Well, while they're sitting there, you know, at the restaurant, they exchanged some kind of casual pleasantries. And then she confronted him about these deaths. 
And she said that basically he kind of changed. And she said it, his response, you know, once she kind of shifted the conversation and decided to just confront him about it, he he changed every, you know, his countenance and everything changed. She said he sat straight up. The color of his eyes changed. He put a smirk on his face and said, I'm going to go down fighting. And I'm getting, I'm picturing that he, he said this with some sort of, ugh, you know, like ominous sort of a tone. Oh yeah, absolutely. You can just tell it by how much it is etched into her brain. Mm-hmm. Oh Yeah. Well, on top of that, you confront somebody and you say, look, I know you're up to something and he knows he's up to something. Yeah, you're going to you're going to get a visceral response. That's not unusual, actually, in real life. When you confront the suspect with evidence that they can no longer refute, it's not uncommon at all to see an actual physical change. I know people think that's a movie thing, but it's not. You can literally look at somebody and watch them change depending on where they're sitting at and how they view the truth. If he had been innocent. You know, the response if. would not have been to smirk. You know, it would be, oh, my gosh, you know, I, yeah. you know, I didn't do, you know, it, it would have been immediate. Just I didn't do that. You know, I didn't do this. You know me, you know, and there was none of that. It was a smirk. It was a very cold, chilling response. So they did arrest him, took him to the police station, and she actually convinced him to start talking. And he confessed. Good. So... They charged him with one count of murder, one count of attempted murder, and then he admitted to homicide detectives Dan Baldwin and Tim Braun that he had murdered two patients in particular, Florian Gall, and attempted to murder Jin Kyung Han, both of whom were patients at Somerset. And then in addition, he told the the detectives that he had murdered as many as 40 patients over his 16-year career. And you guys, I have seen reports of some experts who say that he likely killed more like 400 patients. And based on some of the methodology he was using and the randomness and some of the acts, and of course that's discussed a little better in the movie, but some of the things you'll see, I I don't think that outside of the realm of possibility. I think 400 is probably a bit high, but I would say that's certainly in the shooting range of how he was doing stuff. I mean, if they can guarantee that they, you know, have evidence of 40, you have to assume there's a lot more that you don't know about. I would definitely say hundreds. Again, now you're getting into speculation about how many exactly, but certainly if you've killed 40 that we know of killing another, you know, hundred on top of that, really, I know people are going, well, how's up? It's not impossible. Yeah. He doesn't know. And he, I think he probably did some random things like, you know, just injecting random bags of spiking bags, fluids with insulin and that sort of thing. So he doesn't really know all of the people that he impacted. And I I think the hospitals are going back and looking at death rates and going, you know, wow, there were a lot. There were a lot more deaths during this period when he was working here. And so there's probably a lot more unaccounted for deaths and that that's where they're probably coming up with that number well that on, and on top of it you don't know everywhere he's been or who else has he killed you know i mean there may be information we're not aware of that they're adding to this number but i would definitely say in the hospital setting the way he was doing things i think ben is absolutely correct i think you could easily put this in the hundreds well as part of his plea agreement he promised to cooperate with the authorities if they didn't seek the death penalty for his crimes. And then a month later, he pleaded guilty to the murder of three more patients in New Jersey. November 2004, he pleaded guilty in an Allentown court to killing six patients and trying to kill three others. He repeatedly interrupted the proceedings by taunting the judge with the chant, Your Honor, you need to step down. And at at one point, they even gagged him and put duct tape over his mouth because he wouldn't stop chanting that. And um, he was even after they did that, he was still trying to say that. So, yeah, judges I mean, don't he was like just, that. Yeah, last time I checked, they they do not they like, do not like disrupting that. the court. Also, you know, now that you said that, there's a part of the movie where he repeats something just over thinking that in a maniacal way, and I was like, oh boy, maybe that's where he got the inspiration for that part of the movie because 
Eddie Raymond is maybe a great guy, but I have never wanted to punch somebody in the face so hard as yeah. I did during that interrogation scene. Well, the judge gave him an additional six life sentences. I mean, he's not going to be eligible for parole until June 10th. Yeah. It's a very specific date, 2388 or whatever that date is, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't think he'll be making it. I don't think so either. So he has been working with law enforcement officials to identify victims, additional victims as part of his plea agreement. But I feel like at this point, it's probably for him just a way for him to get attention while he's in jail. Well, I think if you are the family member of somebody that died in one of those hospitals, you would want law enforcement to see, was my loved one killed or did they actually die of what was supposed to have happened? I mean, I think for the police that are working on this, that's there. There's a reason like they there's something for them to gain. So I unfortunately, I think you're right. I think he's getting to relive all his crimes. And unfortunately, that's probably a reward for him in some way. I just think at this point, they probably have gotten all that they're going to really be able to truly get out of him. And anything else is just going to be him using it as an opportunity to have some distraction away from his cell. But but that's just me. You know, I think I, I don't know. I feel like he just needs to like lock him away, throw away the key. Don't think about him anymore. I do know this. Prisoners will do anything to get out of that cell. Yeah. Even if it's taking out the garbage for five minutes. Yeah, don't me, give him do, the satisfaction. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah, don't exactly. give him the satisfaction. Don't give him any breaks. Like that's those family members that are missing their loved ones. They get no breaks. They get none. Yeah. I mean, he can start taking breaks in like twenty two thirty eight. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, he can take a break. That's hundred years before he's eligible for parole. So yeah. That's, <laughs> You know what? I really do want to emphasize how amazing this nurse is, Amy Lofren, yes. for her courage that, you know, in in spite of her situation being a single mom, I think a lot of people would probably look at it like, I've done enough. I can't risk my children. And I think a lot of people would be justified in, in, in saying that. But she was willing to, you know, go that extra step and make sure he was put away. Well, I mean, clearly that was on her mind. She talked to her own daughter about it. You know, so there's that. Two, she works in the hospital. She knows if she gives the hospital a black eye, there's likely to be termination papers or anything like that. Yes. But let's not miss the final fact. The police just asked a person to willingly go sit alone and talk to a murderer and try and get him to admit he murdered people. I yeah. mean- that's a terrifying prospect by itself. It's terrifying because what if he isn't convicted? I mean, you have to, on that side of it, you don't know. I, you don't, I mean, even if you're meeting in a public place, you do not know that it's all going to work out the way you want it to. And he is going to be convicted and he's going to be put away forever and you won't have to worry about it. For all you know, you're going to go through all this. He's going to find out that you were working with the police and then he won't be convicted. And now he's out there free and you are there vulnerable with your children. I, you, you know, all that stuff was going through her mind. Oh, absolutely. And I think they portrayed that nicely in the movie also. There at the end, whenever she was, you know, the uh, detective would come by and said, you know, we're going to have to let him go tomorrow morning. And you could see that process going through her head in the movie. Yeah. And I'm so proud of her. I'm proud of her 11 year old daughter for being so brave to. And um, I feel like she brought, you know, some light back into our profession and some nobility back to us with her actions. She definitely saved some lives, I believe. Yeah, no, for sure. She saved lives because the hospitals apparently were not going to. So between these two detectives and Amy, thankfully, something got done. Well, guys, I think that wraps it up for this story. Anything else? Any other final thoughts you have? If you've not watched the movie and we've not spoiled it for you by talking about this, then <laughs> still go watch the movie because it is a very good movie. It's a, I could watch it again. It's a really oh, yeah. good movie. I, yes. If my wife was like, hey, I want to sit down and watch this now that I've heard you talk about it so much, I would absolutely sit down with her and watch it. I know the feeling. And I think we definitely need to do this again. We need to find another movie, some sort of like true crime story that's had a movie done and let's have another movie night. I love that. It was fun. And I think, I think we, we can do that. Can I take just a second of your show to do to talk about that? Because it was very interesting how we were able to use, and I don't remember what the program was called. I'm sorry. It's in Chrome. What was it? Teleparty? The chat function. Yeah, it was not Teleparty. Oh, 
Oh, teleparty. That's right. We did. Yes. Teleparty is what it was called. So you're actually watching it along with everybody that is in this group. Yeah. And there's a little thing inside of it. So, I mean, it honestly, if we do this again and you guys get the opportunity, please take advantage of that opportunity because it was very, very cool to interact with people live as they're watching the movie. When we were talking about parts of the movie, we were literally talking about it while it was going on the screen. So it was really fun to be able. Also, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a big person on people talking to a movie. So I could just look down, chat for a second, keep watching the movie. Didn't bug anybody. I thought it was great. Yeah, we met up before on Zoom so we could kind of see each other and talk and about it beforehand. Then, But then when we start the movie, we're all just focused on the movie and it starts it all. It starts it for all of us at the exact same time. And yep. there's a it little chat awesome. feature on the side. You don't have to have the chat feature on if you don't personally, if you'd rather not have it. But I loved it. I loved having it on there. And, you know, people would be like, oh, my gosh, blah, blah, blah. You know, oh, it's so creepy, you know. So that yes. was awesome. And then we met up afterwards on back on Zoom. So I loved it. I want to do it again. I agree. Definitely do it. Yeah. Well, guys, remind everybody where they can find you out there in podcast world. And we're on goodnursebadnurse.com. Oh, no, wait, that's you. Oh, wow. I got to do a spit take. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, nice. <laughs> we are at just a Well, I mean, you can find me. At, you can find <laughs> You are definitely on goodnursebadnurse.com. You are there. <laughs> It's true. You can find us at justsomepodcast.com. Our podcasts are Just Some Podcasts for Advanced Practitioners, which is more of our medical show. And then we'll continue to monitor, which is more of our creepy show. Yeah. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It kind of covers the span if you've never listened to it. It's creepy. It's weird. Weird facts. Yeah. Like we cover everything from axe murders to Sasquatch to kids building nuclear reactors in their backyard. We cover the whole wide range. So, but Tina, if they're listening to your show and they don't know where to find you, where can they find you at? I know. You can, you can find me at goodnursebadnurse.com and I'm on all the social media places at goodnursebadnurse. That's me. You can just Google me at Good Nurse, Bad Nurse. Apparently, I just pop up all over the place now. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming back on the show. And I appreciate you all for listening. And I will see you next time. And But, of course, before I leave, I want to... Hold on. I want to say something. And I don't want anybody to forget the entire purpose of how this started, which I'm glad it's going to lead to other shows, hopefully. But... This was all in a celebration of Miss Tina and two million downloads of her show, which, again, Ben and I are in podcasting. That is truly a monumental and significant moment, and she has been far too humble about it. And so I think if you are one of her hardcore listeners, you should reach out to her and let her know just how amazing she is because she is. And let her know that 2 million downloads did not go unrecognized and we can't wait for there to be three. So that's what I think, you know, about Miss Tina. And thank you for having us on the show. And we were happy to celebrate. And like I said, wow, 2 million downloads. You have been far too quiet about that. I think people should know. And you are a well, I'd say, yeah, you're a celebrity now. So, I mean. Yeah, that's how it works. I think that's how it works. Celebrity, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I th- do we actually know? We know a real celebrity now. So, <laughs> thank you. You guys are so sweet. Thank you so much. I am completely humbled and just so thankful for all the people that, for whatever reason, decide to download this podcast <laughs> and listen to me blather on about true crime and nursing every week. I love doing it. So if you guys keep coming back and listen to it, I'll just keep on doing it and keep bringing Tom and Ben along. <laughs> we'll be here. Yeah. Kicking and screaming. I don't want to be here. But I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you guys. I'll see you next week. But I also want to remind you that even if you're a bad girl or a bad boy, be a good nurse. Be the good nurse. But swearing just to pass the time. Lately I see why I am alone. I caught some road bridge and I thought of you. And all the many times you say I should have known. Took a press so I could find my cheek. Find me the awkwardies, the best that I could do. Let's a shower, but I slept all day. 
not the same without you 